A little while ago, we were having a conversation on the podcast with NASA astronaut Don Petit. He was telling us about his solution to the dinosaur paradox, which is that huge dinosaurs with 30-foot wingspans were capable of flight not because physics was different 80 million years ago. They flew because the atmosphere used to be thicker. Not different in composition, there was just more of it. At the same time, some folks in our community brought to our attention that there were some pretty strange issues with the theory of plate tectonics. Now, it's apparent that the continents used to be closer together, as evidenced by continuous bands of rocks and fossils across them. But plate tectonics says that they moved apart from each other because of something called mantle convection, which is where hot magma from the inside of the Earth rises to the surface and creates a circular current underneath the continental plates that pulls them apart over millions of years. But when scientists mapped the mantle, they didn't find any of these circular currents. Instead, they found amorphous plumes of mantle, like these, none of which are aligned with the spreading ridges that are thought to be at the bottom of the ocean floors. And the ocean floors too are weird. On a planet that's supposed to be more than 4 billion years old, there's not a shred of oceanic plate that was formed more than 200 million years ago. This got us thinking. What if plate tectonics happens just a little differently? What if instead of the continents being crammed onto one side of the globe and then spreading out, they align because the Earth used to be squished down to half its present volume? What if Don Petit's thick atmosphere of three times the present pressure didn't go far enough? What if the prehistoric atmosphere was thick enough to squash a planet? Seems a bit far out, but really, how much thicker would it have to be? The answer genuinely surprised us, and we think that it's going to surprise you too. So let's explore the case for decompression tectonics. Plate tectonics has three hypothetical mechanisms that provide the motive force for continental drift seafloor spreading, subduction, and mantle convection. When scientists discovered huge mountain ridges on the bottom of all the world's oceans, with young crusts that appeared to be moving away from a range in either direction, it caused them to hypothesize these were spreading ridges. The seafloor spreading hypothesis they built from these observations says that new oceanic crust is constantly made at the mid-oceanic ridges and then spreads across the ocean floor towards the continental margins. To deal with the problem of how the planet wasn't getting bigger, scientists proposed the subduction hypothesis. Old, cold oceanic crust was getting pushed to the continental margins where it fell deep into trenches that pushed it down into the molten mantle of the Earth. This is why seismic activity was so localized in the trenches. It was slabs of rock breaking and crashing into each other as they melted into the mantle. That just leaves the mantle of convection hypothesis, which is where the story starts to get a little wobbly. In an ideal world, scientists would have looked into the mantle of the Earth and found convection cells, circular currents that would account for the baseball seam ocean ridges and the subduction at the Pacific margins. Each cell's rising limb should have been centered on the mid-ocean ridges. The descending limbs should have been at the trenches. And between them was the flow of hot ductile asthenosphere, which would have provided the conveyor belt necessary to account for millions of years of continental drift, of supercontinent cycles that trace all the way back to the earliest days of a rocky planetary surface. And in that world, we could all sleep peacefully, knowing that everything about the Earth was finally explained. But we don't live in an ideal world, and scientists didn't find the perfect little convection cells. In fact, they seem to have collected data that suggests the currents in the mantle don't look anything like what they expected. Instead of neat little convection cells, tomography studies have discovered huge plumes of mantle scattered around the Earth, almost none of which are found at the mid-ocean ridges. So what's going on? If mantle convection is on the rocks, it might be that our interpretation of what's happening at the mid-ocean ridges and the subduction zone might not be correct either. After all, we don't have a really convincing explanation for why Earth is the only planet in the solar system with tectonics, or why Africa has two spreading rifts and no subduction zones, or why rising convection cells would form long ridges on the ocean floors rather than localized hotspots. But what if we're going about it all wrong? What if all the motion and features we see on the Earth aren't the exclusive products of plate tectonics? What if they're the results of the diameter of the Earth getting bigger? What might this have looked like? Well, to figure it out, 
But we're gonna take a piece of molten glass and we're gonna cover it in copper mesh continents to represent the lithosphere. And Lee from the Glass Forge is going to expand it for us. And as he blows into this molten copper covered sphere, we're gonna see that the continents move away from each other and the ocean basins appear. As the molten earth expands, the continents don't move with it, as they're mechanically uncoupled from the semi-liquid asthenosphere that's below them. In terms of explanatory power, expansion seems to be just as good as plate tectonics. Folded mountain ranges and the intricate shapes of continental margins? Those are the result of a shattered and wrinkled continental crust settling upon a larger earth. The ocean basins? A product of continents moving apart from each other as the Earth got larger. The mid-ocean ridges? The seams from which the Earth expanded. Which neatly explains why the oldest parts of the oceanic basins appear to have only been formed 200 million years ago. Expansion even offers an explanation for all the water these new oceans would need. It turns out there's actually one to three oceans worth of water presently remaining in the mantle in the form of hydrated ringwoodite. Theorized that as expansion released the pressure from magma chambers beneath the brittle, spreading lithosphere, superheated water would have spilled out into the new basins, a situation not entirely different from the one we see on the hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. All in all, it's a neat theory, but is there really a good reason for why we should consider expansion over plate tectonics? Luckily, dedicated expansionists have spent uh, the last 60 years or so putting together a list of reasons outlining all of the ways in which we should prefer expansion to plate tectonics. First, the gaping gores argument. When you reassemble Pangaea on a modern globe, you pretty quickly run into problems. The continents almost, but don't quite fit together perfectly. If you start with just Africa and South America, the pieces of missing crust are quite small, but as you add continental plates, you get to a point where there are whole chunks of oceanic crust that should be older than 200 million years, but are absolutely nowhere to be found today. Expansionists are quick to point out that if you take the same arrangement of continents and then assemble it on a globe that's, say, 20% smaller, they appear to fit together much better without any missing crust. The same thing happens if you try this another way. There's a triple junction of plates in the Indian Ocean. If these plates have moved solely due to spreading, it should be possible to remove the new areas of crust and fit all of the old pieces back together. But when you do that, you again get big gaping gores between the plates that can only be resolved by assembling the continents on a smaller globe. Then there's the question of the Pacific Ocean. Is it getting bigger or is it getting smaller? Most maps of Pangaea on a modern-sized Earth show that the massive continent took up a little less than one hemisphere of the Earth, and the Panthalassic Ocean took up the rest. As the continents moved away from each other to open up the Atlantic, Southern, and Indian Oceans, we would expect the Panthalassic to get smaller, and the distances between North and South America, South America and Antarctica, Antarctica and Australia, Australia and Asia, and Siberia and Alaska to decrease. These decreasing distances are required by spherical geometry. As objects move away from one pole of a sphere, they get farther apart until they cross the great circle, after which they have to start coming closer and closer together. So if Pangaea took up most of a hemisphere, then the continents had to move closer together as the Panthalassic closed. But according to this paper, the continents appear to have only moved farther apart from each other, an impossible feature on a globe of constant diameter. The lengthening ridge paradox points out that the spreading ridges in the Pacific and the Atlantic are shaped like the continents, but they're longer, as shown by the hotspot tracks that emanate from the continental margins to the spreading ridge. Consider two ridges in the South Atlantic, the Rio Grande Rise off the coast of Brazil and the Walvis Ridge off the coast of Namibia. They have a line of seamounts that intersect right at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, about 760 miles south of where they start at the continental shelf. At the same time, the northern and southern ends of the ridge have moved away from each other, and so have ended up longer than the continental margins. It's pretty hard to explain this on an Earth of constant diameter, but on an expanding Earth, the geometry falls into place much more easily. An Earth that expands from 80% to the present-day diameter would need to nearly double in volume. 
1961 paper exploring the mechanics of expansion suggested that if this increase in size came from chemical expansion, then that would have required nearly every single molecule on Earth to dissociate to, upon association, supply the necessary energy for expansion by chemical means. The authors also point out that even if you turn the entire Earth into dynamite and blow it up, it still only expands by about 4%. Proponents of the theory have heard these criticisms, and they turned to spooky physics to explain how it could have happened. Expansion of space-time, or a modification of the universal gravitational constant, but at the end of the day, they don't actually know how it could have happened. But what if the expansionists are going about this all wrong? What if the Earth didn't expand by having material added to it, or through chemical means? What if it decompressed? The Dino Paradox! <laughs> We started thinking about this a long time ago when we interviewed NASA astronaut Don Petit about the dinosaur problem. In short, it's a size paradox. How is it that the biggest bird on Earth today is the wandering albatross with an 11-foot wingspan, but 200 million years ago, pterodons with 30-foot wingspans ruled the skies? Quetzalcoatlus and Hatsaragopteryx are what you would call a scientific mystery because their skeletons violate the first principles of flight which is that there's a reasonably linear relationship between weight and wing size. If you plot this relationship for all flying objects, from fruit flies to albatrosses to 747s, you end up with a linear relationship between weight and wing loading, as shown on Tenneke's Great Flight Diagram. And it turns out that the huge flying dinosaurs from 200 million years ago are really weird. The ratio between their bodies and their wings seems to violate the trend that not only holds for most living creatures, but airplanes as well. Some scientists have explained this away by saying the pterodons didn't actually fly, that they were gliders. Which could be a plausible explanation if there weren't other dinosaurs, like the brontosauruses, that also seem to violate the laws of physics by being too big to walk, given the physical limitation of bone density versus body size. So how did these giants carry their bodies against the force of gravity, and what does it have to do with expansion? Well, people like Don Petit and David Esker argue that these creatures did fly, not because they violated everything we know about biology and physics or that physics was different. Instead, they suggest that the atmosphere was thicker than it is today, and this added buoyancy. If there was more atmosphere 65 million years ago, it's possible that there was even more atmosphere before that. The only question is how thick does that atmosphere need to be to compress the Earth down to 80% of the present size? We start with the fact that all material objects, including the Earth itself, have quantifiable stiffness, meaning they'll reproducibly compress in proportion to a given force that's applied to them. The ratio between the supplied force, called stress, and the resulting deformation, called strain, has a name. Young's modulus, in honor of Thomas Young, who in addition to being a phenomenal material scientist, also gave us the wave theory of light. The average Young's modulus for the Earth has been empirically determined through seismic studies and is thought to be around 4.5 times 10 to the 11th newtons per square meter, or 450 gigapascals. Strain is a dimensionless property that represents the percentage of compression, which is 0.2 in our case. Solving for stress, we'd need 90 gigapascals of pressure to compress the Earth to 80% of its present diameter. So how much atmosphere is that? We don't have the firepower to do the calculation of a spherical atmosphere compressing the planet from all directions. So to get in the ballpark, we have to simplify the system all the way down to a one by one meter column of air pressing down on a corresponding sliver of Earth. If we assume ancient Earth had an atmospheric density like that of Jupiter, some 3.5 times thicker than our present day air at 34,000 pascals per meter, then we only need 2,622 kilometers of atmosphere to squash the Earth which seems like a lot, but it's still way less than Jupiter's 54,000 kilometers of atmosphere, which makes early Earth a rather diminutive gas planet. Since today's atmosphere is around 12 kilometers tall, then the early Earth's atmosphere only needs to be about 200 times taller, which is a seriously thick atmosphere, and it's hard to imagine how we lost it all. But what if it's been disappearing for a while? Like, a billions of years while? It's possible that most of the atmosphere was gone before the rifts even appeared as we know that certain materials can take a lot of tension before failing. We know that rupture dynamics can be sudden and jarring, and so the Earth's rifts could have been triggered by the crust cooling and becoming brittle over the ages. So is it a slam dunk for decompression tectonics? Not exactly. 
Like we said earlier, one issue with this calculation is that there's a lot of non-linearities. When we converted atmospheric pressures into strain units, we had to include gravitational forces in the conversion, since we're dealing with newtons. And as the planet compresses, the gravity would also increase, changing our conversion. And also, there's the angular momentum question, and the temporospatial dynamics of decompression, so I don't, I don't think we're done here, but I think that we are moving in a good direction. That's the whole point of our projects. We explore, and we keep searching for stories to tell about the natural world. We tell stories of what might have happened, and keep our eyes open and on the world to see what will. This is a wild theory, and it was a real joy to put the video together, and now we need your help for the rebuttals part of this. So get into the comments and tell us what you think. Tell us what's wrong with plate tectonics, tell us what's wrong with expansion, tell us what's wrong with decompression, and maybe we'll figure it out. A huge thank you to one of our patrons, Steve Athern, who is essentially the Demystify Sci librarian on this project and has been doing research on the topic for many, many years and really helped us get in the right direction and figure out the sources that we need to make sense of this. Thank you to all of our patrons, whose support is absolutely vital for us being able to make these movies. Thank you also to Lance Weaver from the Utah State Geologist Office, who helped us get all of the plate tectonic stuff straight. If you like what we did, share it with somebody. That way we can bring more people into the fold come up with better ideas for what's actually happening. And if you really like what we do, support us on Patreon. We're at patreon.com slash demystify sci. We have PayPal, we take crypto, whatever ways you want to help the project. We would really, really, really appreciate it. Scientific revolution starts now.